Community's consensus. The climate is changing. Carbon emissions are driving that change. Emissions come from burning fossil fuels. So if we want to slow or even reverse the change, we must lower our fossil fuel use. By charging a fee on fossil fuels and returning that revenue to households as a dividend, we can do just that, starting a chain of positive effects. Fossil fuels become less desirable. Cleaner sources of energy become more competitive. The dividend creates millions of jobs. Carbon emissions go down, reduced air pollution saves tens of thousands of lives, and climate change is brought under control. We can make this happen, but enacting a carbon fee and dividend isn't in our hands, it's in theirs. How do we sway them? What can we do? We can use our voices to express political will and demand action. We must help our elected leaders work together. It's on us to tell them what we want as a group. Because when voices call out together, their impact multiplies. Government can respond to the will of the people, provided we tell the government what we want. And what we want is a livable world. This is what Citizens Climate Lobby works for. To empower citizens to connect with and influence their members of Congress. To spread the idea that each one of us can address climate change. Bring your voice to citizensclimatelobby.org. Dr. Mark Reynolds. I'm Dr. Mark Reynolds. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, you're not a doctor. No, right? that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you all for coming out on the line tonight. That's fantastic. Uh, the video is pretty typical of our organization that was written, produced, and fundraised by one of our groups of volunteers. So we are essentially an all-volunteer organization, and uh, this was one of those groups who said, we need a video, we need something that can get the, uh, is short enough to get the attention span of millennials, and it's about two minutes long. <laughs> And then we got a major coup. We got Ian Summerholder, the narrator, who's the, the actor who's the star of the Vampire Di Diaries. So our membership amongst teenage girls has jumped significantly. Ah! And so that's, that's also been important. <laughs> um, so uh, I am not going to get into the science very much at all. Um, Peter mentioned Dr. James Hansen. Dr. Hansen is considered to be our country's leading climate scientist. So we are very, very happy that every time he gives a talk or writes a paper, he tells people they need to join our organization. Um, we call him technically a member of our advisory board, but we tell him that he's really the head of sales and marketing for us. Because when you have a climate scientist out there promoting you, it's been a good thing driving lots and lots of people to us. Um, a lot of the best scientists in the world are right up the road at Scripps. So if you actually wanted to talk to scientists, they're pretty easy to get access to. Um, there, is, there aren't outliers in the scientific community anymore. Uh, this, this issue is resolved, um, that we know, we've known for 150 years that burning fossil fuel uh, traps heat. Uh, we know that that's created a steady warming over the last several, uh, quite a, the last about 100 years. Um, the scientific papers in the 80s that started to say we would see a, a greater increase in the severity and frequency of weather-related events is happening. Uh, Hurricane as it was because the Atlantic Ocean is 8 to 10, 10 inches higher than it used to be. Um, so the things that the scientists have been predicting are happening. Um, you know, the California drought, can you tie the, what's happening in California right now? Probably not. The, uh, the scientific papers say that the current drought is within the range of what scientists call natural vari variability over the last If you look at the thou last thousand this current drought fits in that, in with what has happened over the last thousand years. What's made this particular drought so dramatic is California is much warmer than it used to be. So this current drought is 36% more impactful on us right now because you've combined both heat and drought. So if you ask people, is this of global warming? No. But you combine it with the warming that happens and it's been particularly impactful. Again, we have the best scientists in the world right up here at Scripps. I'm not going to get into the, the, that part. I'm going to get into the solution part. So as the video pointed to, we're working on a very simple, straightforward solution. We call it the George Shultz Plan. Uh, former Se Secretary of State Shultz is on our board. Uh, this is the solution he proposes. Um, we know that we need to work with people from both sides of the aisle if we're going to be successful with Congress. And having someone of Secretary of State's 
credentials, Schultz's credentials, not only on our board, but saying that this is the right solution, has been an enormous help to us in working with Republican offices. Okay, so I'm gonna get into that solution in a little bit, but I wanna get at a way of working on this also. We think not only what you do, but how so I'm gonna ask you to do an exercise in a minute that we ask all of the groups to do before they ever start working on the issue. We think it's important that organization works in relationship to what it's for, not in relationship to what it's against. See, I think everybody knows what they're opposed to, who they don't like, what they don't want. That doesn't take anything, it's lazy. It's what the whole uh, talk radio and cable work on is who is a jerk, who's a blockhead. So we don't want to do that. We want to actually see what is it about this planet we're in favor of, what are we, what are we for, what do we want. So in a moment, what I'm going to ask you to do is do an exercise, and I want you to identify something very specific that has the potential of being jeopardized by climate change. We can't always predict exactly what is going to happen or what's not going to happen, but we have a pretty good idea of things that are in jeopardy now because of changing climate conditions. And so I want you to identify something very specific that you want to make sure is around for future generations. Now the reason we do this exercise is twofold. One is, is because we want to have our conversation inside of something we want, not trying to avoid something we don't want. But here's the other thing. I know that everybody you talk to about this issue has very specific things that they love about this planet, that they want to make sure are preserved. You know, I was having a conversation with uh, Barry Goldwater Jr. about two months ago, and uh, he was saying his dad used to take him on hikes all the time, and his dad loved pine trees. And he used to walk him up to particular pine trees, and he'd say, son, this tree has more character than many of the men you'll meet in your life. <laughs> and so why it's somebody ideologically not agree with. It's someone who loves things about the planet like I do. You know, there was a senator from Virginia named Senator Warner several iterations ago. I don't know how it is, as if your last name's Warner, it's almost impossible not to get elected to the Senate in Virginia. But it just it seems to increase the chances. Well, one of them, several iterations ago, uh, didn't seem to be interested in anything on climate, and then suddenly started putting his nose to and talking about introducing climate legislation. I had lunch with his daughter last summer, and she said what drove that was he loves to fly fish. And trout are extremely sensitive to temperature change. So the ranges in which he could fly fish have been shrinking. So we know people, whether we agree with them on an ideological point of view or a political point of view, doesn't matter because we know we can find commonality in things that they love about the planet like we love about the planet. Okay, so in a minute, I'm going to ask you to pair up with someone sitting close to you and identify something very specific that could be jeopardized by climate change. Let me give you a simple example for me. When I was a little kid, my favorite thing to do in the summer was to wander the neighborhood with my brother John, who was two years older than me, eating fresh fruit off of our neighbor's trees. Now, there are a couple things that were great about that. One, when something ripens on a tree, it doesn't taste like what you get in the store, does it? But if you also have to jump over a fence to get it, doesn't it make it taste a little bit better? <laughs> so like one fence over was apricots, two fences down were cherries, there was grapes across the street in an alley. My favorite tree was a plum tree that was across the street and up a block. And um, it was only a couple of steps off the sidewalk. And um, why I pointed at my son is because I planted a plum tree because I wanted him to be able to eat them. Um, so, um, uh, you know, you didn't have to worry about a crabby old man or a dog because it was just a few steps off a sidewalk. You'd get it. You'd eat the big red plums. So I have been planting fruit trees in my backyard for 30 years. Um, I have three children. John is my youngest. Uh, and it wasn't so much that I expected that they would have so much the experience of eating fresh fruit off the trees, but that their kids would. So I planted one of those particular kind of plum trees, and it started making plums. And five years ago, it stopped making plums. So I went to the nursery near our house, and I said, what's the problem? Usually they say, oh, it's been attacked by this, or it's got this disease. And here's what the people at the nursery said. They said, it doesn't get cold enough in the winter in San Diego any longer for that plum tree to go through the cycle it needs to go through to make fruit. So almost every kind of fruit tree needs a certain number of hours under 45 degrees every winter. And that plum tree doesn't get cold enough to go through the cycle of making fruit. 
Now in the big picture, who cares about my particular palm tree? But what's important here is, is that we work with people in a way that we know there's things that they're in favor of and that we can work on a solution in relationship to what we want, not uh, what we're opposed to or who we don't like, et cetera. Okay, so point to someone close to you and say, you're going to be my partner for this exercise. And if there needs to be three of you, just say, okay, like this table, you might say all three of you. So there's another person there. Okay, is there anybody that doesn't have someone to talk to? Okay, do you need someone to talk to? Okay, can you, can, you, can you pair up right here and then we'll have them pair across the table here? Okay. So don't start talking just yet. So what you're going to do is, is I want you to share something very specific. Not like, oh, I love the beach or I love the forest. No, some sp particular place you like to go or that you've been that, you, that has the potential of being jeopardized by global warming, but you want to make sure that particular place, that particular thing you've done is available for future generations. So now here's how we're going to decide who goes first and who goes second. Gaze over at your partner, and whoever has the sexiest eyes, you go first. OK, go ahead. Tess definitely has the sexier eyes. She had to go first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, if you haven't switched yet, see if you can wrap up what you're talking about and give the other person a chance to go also. Okay, just go ahead and wrap that up. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so again, we do that exercise for two reasons. One is we want to work in relationship to what we're for, what we're in favor of, rather than what we're opposed to. And also, because that no matter whether you agree with someone ideologically or not, I guarantee you there are things that they love about the planet that that's where we can start with and how we're going to deal with this are very specific things that they love. Uh, I think it's always easier to start where we're opposed to people, so we would prefer to always do the harder work. OK, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you a really teensy bit of background on our organization because it's relevant to what we're going to do. Then I'm going to walk you through a model for creating political will. So our starting point is, is that in general, politicians don't create political will. They respond to it. So if you know how to actually generate political will, the politics can become an inevitability. Then I'm going to walk you through a very specific solution that was mentioned in the video, and then we'll open it up for questions. Okay? And we'll do that all in, in not a ton of time. So um, 
you know, my friend used to tell me all the time, being talked to death is a terrible death. I do not plan to talk you to death tonight. Um, okay, so quick background on the organization. Peter mentioned a gentleman by the name of Marshall Saunders. Uh, Marshall spent 20 years before he started Citizens Climate Lobby setting up microcredit loans in third world countries. I think a lot of people have heard of Muhammad Yunus, who won the Nobel Prize for inventing uh, micro lending in the Grameen Bank. Uh, Marshall's initiated over a million microcredit loans. Um, you know, those can be as small as five, ten, fifty dollars. Uh, Ninety-eight percent of microcredit loans are repaid. So once you start the process, they you continue to have more and more people. Actually, I got that, but more is better. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, uh, so then what happens is these women, almost exclusively, lift their family up out of poverty by starting a small business in their village. And those businesses could be things like basket weaving. It could be buying a couple of chickens and selling eggs. There's a woman uh, in Mexico who we lend her $50, and that was enough to fix a broken sewing machine, fix it up, and start selling clothing. So he was actually just dedicating his life to doing as much as he could about poverty. When he saw what was happening with climate change, where it first woke him up was when he saw Vice President Gore's movie, The Inconvenient Truth. And he immediately realized that there was a very good chance that everything he was doing about poverty would be undone by climate change. So he decided to throw himself completely at poverty, I mean at climate change, global warming, the way he'd thrown himself at microcredit. The first thing he did is, is he got trained to make the climate project presentation, which is just a basic scientific presentation uh, about what's happening along with some of the things people can do to reduce their own carbon footprint. Then he was doing it, you, you know, you all know people like this in your life. People only have one gear. Marshall either does things fanatically or he doesn't do them. And so he did this fanatically. And uh, after one of his early presentations, he talked to a group of people in Rancho Bernardo, about 25, 30 people. They were pretty enthusiastic. Uh, he felt good, like that they were going to go do things for themselves. He gets up and he reads the paper the next morning. And the paper said that Congress had just enacted an $18 billion tax break for oil companies. So he put the paper down and he said, you know, I gave a talk last night and I think I got 18 light bulbs changed last night. And this is an $18 billion tax break. You know, I got a lot of light bulbs to go. So he realized in that instant that it was important to talk to people, but really who he needed to talk to was Congress. Now, if seven years ago you had come to me and said, what you need to deal with is global warming and Congress at the same time. In other words, the two most screwed up things on the planet. <laughs> I would have told you that was the single stupidest idea I've ever heard. Marshall, on the other hand, said, oh, I, I know exactly what to do here. And the reason he could say, I know exactly what to do here, is the whole time he'd been working in microcredit, he'd been doing it in, in relationship with an organization called Results. Results is like us, an all-volunteer organization. They work on poverty issues. And here's what Results proved. They proved if you organize groups of people by congressional district, the reason it's important to organize people by congressional district is if you live in the district, your member of Congress essentially has to see you. So it means you have access because you live in the district. But then if you, you had to give people a good structure of support, so if they did something last month, they would also do something this month. And then you also needed to set up a condition where people would train themselves. You couldn't give people talking points. You needed to set up conditions where people would rehearse talking points. So whether they were giving a talk to the public, meeting with a member of Congress, talking to the media, they had internalized talking so if someone said, well, what if we do something and China doesn't do something? What's the difference between cap and trade and a carbon tax? What's the impact on jobs? What's the overall impact on the economy? You needed to have people who would internalize their response. So results prove that if you did all those things, you could get Congress to do really interesting things. So what do I mean by something interesting? Well, 30 years ago, results started asking the US Congress to appropriate money to alleviate world and the US Congress at that point was appropriating $25 million a year. We have been for quite some time appropriating over a half a billion dollars a year, and last year, $2 billion. And when you talk to members of Congress about how is that happening, in these kind of difficult budget times, they say it's because the results volunteers are so effective. So here's what Marshall said seven years ago. All we need to do is find an organization that is doing that same type of systematic grassroots support and that kind of structured support, and we can get effective climate legislation passed. 
He couldn't find anybody doing that. So seven years ago, what we simply did was replicated that model. We haven't walked away from microcredit. We still have a big microcredit lending organization that is still going on in Mexico. It's just all of our efforts are organized towards generating political will. You know, the last time the US got really close to passing something was in 2009. The House of Representatives passed something called Wexman Market that I'll talk about in a little bit. Then the Senate couldn't get 60 votes for everything, and so it all fell apart. There's a political scientist at, at Harvard named Theda Scotchpole. She wrote over a 100-page criticism of that effort, and she said at the heart of the failure was the lack of a grassroots effort. She said all the support for the legislation in inside the Beltway in Washington, D.C., and what we really needed was the grassroots support back district by district by district so the members of Congress would know if they made the tough vote, they would be supported at home. So how could a model like that work? Well, here, at the heart of our model, we do something very similar to what Results does, and that is once a month, the first Saturday of each month, we have a call, and all the groups get together, so the people at this table are with our North County group, and you get together people houses in Lucadia and Encinitas, right? And then everybody calls in together. And um, we do three things. First, we educate ourselves. So we've had the best scientists in the world on. We've had Dr. Hansen on. We've had many other Nobel Prize winning scientists, a lot of the people at Scripps, you know, people, scientists in particular areas like ocean acidification, glaciers, uh, you know, different components of the science of climate change. We've had a ton of economists on. And economists all essentially say the same thing. If you want less of something, and you want less of it quickly, the fastest way to make that happen is to make it more expensive. They always point to cigarette smoking. You know, over 50% of Americans used to smoke, and now less than 20% do. And the economists insist education helped, but price was the single biggest factor. There is an English economist by the name of Alfred Pigou. He invented something called Pigovian taxation. And what Pigovian taxation says is sometimes the market fails. Sometimes you buy goods and they cost way less than they should because they don't include what economists call externalities, what you and I might call the cost to society. So there are still huge costs to you and I for people smoking cigarettes. We still pay amount of health costs because smoking cigarettes creates so many problems with people's hearts and lungs. Same thing with burning fossil fuels. I mean, if, if we weren't um, worried about protecting oil in the Mideast for so many years, how much money and time do you think we would have spent there? So how much of our military budget do you want to, to attribute to protecting interests, oil interests around the world? Same thing with health benefits. We know that thousands and thousands of Americans die every year because the air is dirty. How much of our health insurance and Medicare and Medicaid costs do you want to attribute to the burning of fossil fuels? And then the scientists have been saying, that at least since the 1980s, that we would see more extreme weather events. Certainly FEMA's budget has grown accordingly. So what percentage of the Hurricane Sandys, et cetera, do you want to attribute? So economists say, what you simply do is begin to internalize the externalities. Now here's the beauty at looking at global warming from the perspective of an economist. Many of the economists who speak out about this are really well-known conservative economists. So I mentioned former Secretary of State Schultz is on our board. Art Laffer, Reagan's economist, believes in this. Greg Mankiw, Professor Mankiw from Harvard, that was George W. Bush's economist. Douglas Holt Eakin, that was the, the economic advisor to both the Romney and the McCain campaigns. So these are really well-known conservative economists in DC who say that a, that a Pigovian carbon tax is the correct thing to do, correct the existing market failure, and let the market go to work. So we have a lot of economists come on, and essentially they all say the same thing. The simplest, cleanest, most effective way to deal with the problem is just to begin to increase its price to include what it really costs to society. I had some really other interesting scientists. There's a gentleman in a, a, at Stanford named Mark Jacobson. Mark Jacobson wrote one of the peer-reviewed papers, there are others, that shows how we can uh, get all of the world's energy from renewable sources and that it can be done in 20 years. Why do I think that paper is so important? Well, I can go around shaking my hands all the time saying clean energy is better than dirty area. It's really important that we have peer-reviewed science that says, here's all the places where wind, solar, and geothermal are all viable, so we know we can 
actually transition the world to renewable energy. There's also a guy who used to be at Berkeley who's now at Stanford, <clears throat> Rob Willer, who wrote a paper called Apocalypse Soon, Dire Messaging is Counterproductive on Global Warming. You can kind of understand what the study was from the title. Apocalypse Soon, Dire Messaging is Counterproductive on Global Warming. Here's what his study showed. If the only thing you do is give people the doom and gloom related to what's going to happen from global warming, you actually hurt the problem more than you help. You can give people all the problems. You can talk about ocean acidification. You can talk about retreating glaciers, uh, rising temperatures, as long as you do one more thing, and that is to add in a solution. The second you add a solution, the person who's listening to you completely changes. If you only give them doom and gloom, most of the people think you probably don't really understand the science, because it can't be that bad. The minute you add a solution, that same person says, wow, I finally met somebody who understands this issue. So it's, it's absolutely essential that we be working on and talking about solutions. That is if you want people to come along. If all you want to do is depress people and show them you know more than they, they do, you can talk doom and gloom. But if you want them to do something, You've got to talk to them about solutions. OK, then the last expert I'll talk about is Catherine Hayhoe. Catherine Hayhoe is a climate scientist who teaches at Texas Tech University. What's interesting to us about her, a lot of things, but one is she's evangelical. And her husband is an evangelical minister in Texas. Now, he, for a long time, and the first several years that they were married, took a literal translation of the Bible and always asserted that the planet was 6,000 years old. She's a climate scientist. So she's looking at hundreds of thousands of years and sometimes millions of year trends. She used to say about this, on this issue, we have just agreed to disagree, <laughs> which I find extraordinarily generous from a science point of view. He's come along over time. What Dr. Hale's been working with us on is not so much the science, but what she says is, my faith, as an evangelical, tells us that we need to be good stewards of the planet. And we know we're not doing it. And what she essentially said to us is, if you'll talk to people of faith about stewardship and not have to have them accept the science, there's a lot of people that want to help you. They just want to do it on their terms. That was an extraordinary moment for our organization because we really thought that we could only work with people who looked at this from a scientific point of view, but seeing that there were all kinds of people that wanted to help but they wanted to help it from their perspective, was really, really important. So anyway, at the heart of our model is, first of all, educating ourselves. Then every month, we have a short talk called a laser talk. And the laser talk is just, you know, what if somebody says, what about China? What if we do something and China doesn't? What if somebody says, oh, this is going to kill jobs? What if somebody says, how do you compare this to what the EPA is doing? It's just a short talk so that every month you more, feel more confident that you can address everything that relates to this, no matter what anybody could bring up. And then the third thing we do is we get into collective action. So we spend a lot of time sitting down with our congressional representatives. Last year, we had over 1,000 meetings with members of Congress in their offices. Um, I don't know any other group on this issue that met with members of Congress so much. Um, we had 2,200 letters to the editor published in newspapers, over 300 op-eds and about 50 editorial board meetings. So we do a lot of communicating to the public, but a lot of just sitting down with congressional offices. And I think we're the only organization working on this issue that spent more time with Republicans than with Democrats in the last few years. We had been to Eric Cantor's office 11 times before he lost his primary. We've been to Inhofe's office. We've been to Inhofe's office three times. We haven't met with Inhofe yet. You know, He's the one who wrote the book that global warming is the biggest hoax ever posted upon the American public. You know, the um, Norman, Oklahoma chapter called me uh, before the first meeting and said, we really got a meeting in Inhofe's office. What are we supposed to do? <laughs> <You know? laughs> I said, first of all, walk in and say, we come in peace. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, <clears throat> One of our gauges is how long is the meeting. You know, usually they tell you they'll give you a half hour if it's an aide, 15 minutes if it's a member of the House or Senate. Um, they were there for over an hour which is always our first indication that we're doing something we should be doing, because they ask us to stay longer. And then, uh, I don't know, how, how many of you have ever met with a congressional aide? How many of you ever done that? OK, so you know, usually 20s, maybe 30s, right? Young, smart people, usually, really informed. So the young aide is walking out with our four women faculty in the 50s and 60 years old uh, from the University of Oklahoma and said, you know, people think Senator Inhofe's a bad guy, but he's not a bad guy. 
Uh, people think that Senator Inhofe eats children, but he doesn't eat children. <laughs> you know, so I've always wanted to meet with Senator Inhofe and say, you know, I've only ever got one meeting note that says you do not eat children. <laughs> Can you either confirm or deny that that is in fact the case? At any rate, so every month we do that. We educate ourselves, we get better at speaking about the issue, and then we all get into collective action, either meeting with members of Congress, writing, meeting with groups of people, etc. Okay, what is the very specific policy? It was talked through on the video, but here's what we're promoting. We're doing essentially what the economists say we should do. We put a steadily rising fee on carbon-based fuels. We don't get it where the price needs to be eventually because it would disrupt the economy too much. So what we do is we start at $15 a ton, CO2 and CO2 equivalents, and then raise it $10 a year for as long as we need to. So it's a steadily raising fee so that consumers and businesses have time to adjust. But then the second part of the policy is at least as important as the first part. We take every single dollar and we give it back to households. Why do we give all the money back? First, we give all the money back because most Republicans in the House of Representatives have signed something called a Grover Norquist tax pledge. And what that tax pledge says is they won't vote for any new tax that grows government. This doesn't. So they can still honor their Grover Norquist tax pledge and do the right thing. Second, if we put a steadily rising fee on the burning of coal, oil, and natural gas, those companies are going to pass that cost through, aren't they? So that means yours and my energy costs are going to go up. Not only our energy costs go up, because some businesses' costs will go up, they're going to pass that through to us also. If we give all of the money back to households, two-thirds of households actually come out equal or better. So anybody who has a reasonable carbon footprint comes out great. So for instance, we have one car in my, my family. My wife and I share a car. I ride my bike to work. We come out great. So if you have multiple airplanes, multiple houses, a couple of big boats, your energy costs are probably going to go up. But it also incentivizes people to be more reasonable with their carbon footprint so that that monthly check actually stretches and goes further. So we, we give it back so that uh, American households will support the, the bill because they have the money to, in, to deal with their increase in cost. And then the third may be, this may be the most important. We don't pick any winners and losers. And um, we know we're not going to get any Republicans on a bill if we're saying where the money should go. So we say, OK, we correct the market failure, let the market go to work. What it does, what economists say it will also do, is send a price signal to people who invest in the future of energy. Bankers, venture capitalists, you know, anybody that's going to be creating the new energy economy, knowing that the fossil fuel side of our economy is going to be gone soon. So that if they're going to invest in research, all the research should be in renewable energy. So for instance, we know that we need better battery technology. And we know somebody's going to become a gazillionaire off of that. I'm cool with that. I just want the market to see the incentives that it makes sense for more people in investing in batteries so that we develop that technology faster than later. OK, I'll, I'll add one more piece. So last year, we hired an organization called REMI, Regional Econo Economic Modeling Incorporated to see what would the economic impact of our policy be. We hired Remy, first of all, because of their reputation in the marketplace of almost any time somebody wants to know what the impact of social uh, public policy is going to be on the economy, they go to Remy. So, uh, uh, and we didn't want to go to a think tank. Because if we went to a think tank, then people could accuse us of ideological bias. There are some phenomenal, really smart economists in different think tanks, and we could have gone to them, but they, would, you know, they could have said, oh, you, you're starting with some predisposed bias. We, Remy just does economic modeling. They don't have any skin in the game on climate change. They just, they just run the jobs numbers for you. The author of the report from ours was a Republican that went to Iowa State University. So I kind of, that kind of helped us also. So it couldn't make it seem like this is some left-wing conspiracy or something. So the question really was, if you put a steadily rising fee on carbon-based fuels, you then distributed that equally to household, and so you're putting that much money in the economy, what would the overall economic benefit or hurt be? And interestingly enough, after 20 years, you add 2.8 million jobs against the baseline. So you end up with this net increase of jobs. You have steady growth in GDP. 
You have 13,000 lives saved a year because the air is cleaner, and you have a 50% reduction in emissions over 20 years. So it ends up you can't find anywhere where there's bad news. Now, it's the economic modeling like that is done by regions. Some regions of the country do better than others. For instance, the region of the country where Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas are doesn't do as well as many other regions because they have so many fossil fuel related jobs. But actually, their job numbers come out OK. It's their GDP that isn't, doesn't really do as well as other parts of the country because a lot of those you know, refineries, you have one person that pushes a button that creates a gazillion dollars. So you're not losing a bunch of jobs, but you are simply some of that revenues shifting over to renewables. OK. Let me stop here and just see what questions you've had so far. We have a microphone. Anything you'd like to ask about anything that I've covered? So we do have a microphone we can hand around, or Peter will, for anything that anybody would like to ask at all. Smartest guy in the room on how to do this economically. Okay. I'm, um, I'm Keith. I'm curious about the scope of your organization. How many congestion? Congressional districts are there? How many of them have you got organizations in? How many people are you all Great. told? Yeah, okay, so um, uh, I came here six years ago and there were six volunteer groups and 25 volunteers and we thought we were pretty formidable then. Uh, and then every year for the next five years we doubled in size. So we went from six groups to 12 to 24 to 48. Last year we set a goal of being in every congressional district. So there's 435 congressional districts and 100 senators. We want to make sure we had coverage for all of those. We're in all but 23 congressional districts now. So we went last year from 2,000, excuse me, in April of last year, 4,000 people have registered themselves as supporters on our website to 12,000 by the end of the year. Um, we've remained a very small staff. Um, we run our organization on a uh, million and a half dollars a year because um, it's always going to be an all-volunteer organization. Uh, Gene Karpinski, who runs the League of Conservation Voters, ran into one of our volunteers last year and said, I heard you had 600 people in Washington, D.C., and that you saw over 500 offices. And we said, yeah, that's right. And he said, what's your budget? And, and we said, a million and a half. And he said, that's impossible. Nobody can do that. So uh, it's, it's it really the, the phenomena that's called Citizens Climate Lobby is really showing what happens when volunteers decide to light themselves up. You know, probably the thing that people are most cynical about is government and politics. And when people make the choice of rather than just commiserating with their friends about how bad it is, to regularly sit down with their member of Congress, things change for people. And, it's, and they start to do interesting things like making that video because they say, what else do we need to do? Um, so, you know, we're a small, new organization. Um, we're just causing a lot of trouble. So. Yeah. So do groups form in the, uh, where they live? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because it, it, essentially that model is set up because if you live in the district, essentially your member of the house has to see you. So for instance, you know, we've been in to see Paul Ryan five or six times. And I've been in a couple of those meetings, and, and he's a joy to sit down with. Really smart, quick, ask good questions, fun. I, I could find very few places that he and I agree with ideologically. But in terms of a person that I can work with, I find him to be someone it's really easy to work with that I like working with. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Do you have this is Carol Jan. Yeah, my name is Carol Jan. Do you have any measure of the impact that you've had? Um, are there numbers of legislators that sign on? There's no legislation yet proposed, I'm guessing, but what, what measure do you have that you're beginning to get more legislators on yeah, your side. Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of things that you can look at. Um, one is we, we kind of say that we're 100% failure rate until we get the bill we want passed. But last year, there were five bills introduced in the House and Senate. Uh, all of them were influenced by what we're doing. So the previous time there was a chance to pass legislation in the House, they had something called Waxman-Markey, which the architecture of that is cap and trade with offsets, which I'll talk about. It. We've been talking about a carbon fee or a carbon tax for the last six years. Every single bill, except for one, was a carbon tax last year. The one that wasn't, the Van Hollen bill, had 100% of the money going back as a monthly check like we are also arguing for. So you can see a, a definite change in the way 
members of Congress are talking about solutions. But the other things that are happening that I find interesting is the American Enterprise Institute, pretty conservative think tank in DC, hosted a forum on the economics of a carbon tax. I don't think they could do that without the you know, 1,200 letters to the editor we did two years ago and the 2,200 we did last year. And our Street Institute, which is at least as conservative as, uh, as American Enterprise Institute, hosted a debate last year on should conservatives support a carbon tax. So you see that, and you also see more and more thought leaders speaking up. So you see four, four Republican former EPA administrators saying we need to do something about climate change. I think we're changing the condition in which the issue is being discussed. And I, I, I think it's a combination of two things. One is a laser-like focus on one solution. And then the other is we made a choice early on that every time we met with or talked to or talked about an elected official, the basis of that discussion would be admiration, respect, and gratitude for their public service so that we would not join the bunch of people who shake their fist at people. You know, I was in uh, Senator McCain's office about six months ago. And I was talking to the receptionist, just waiting for the aide to come out. And I said, how's it going? You know, well, it's OK. How long have you been here? I've been in a year. She goes, I'm not completely cynical yet. I said, really? She said, you know what? I wish every American had to just sit here and answer our phones for one hour. And what it became obvious to me from that moment, amongst a lot of others, as we as citizens provide a gutter for politicians to work in, um, you know, we usually only describe them with the lowest common denominator terms and mostly for the people we disagree with. So I think that we're influencing things both by bringing respect to the discussion and saying these people are serving our country, they deserve our respect, and at the same time making a laser-like coherent argument for a solution. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Cecilia, in one of the um, tensions with the, the carbon fee approach, but, uh, technology that we're, especially on the renewable end, some of it is gonna take a little longer than 20 years to fully actualize. Yeah. So some detractors say if we start using the carbon fee to fund it, we can essentially reduce our use on carbon fuels faster than we can get the new technology in place. So how do you balance that out? Yeah, it's a really good question. So the, and the, the question falls in the line we hear a lot of people of, aren't there better uses of the revenue? You know, couldn't you fund research on renewables? Couldn't you do mass transit? Couldn't you pay down the deficit? So the que you, you have to make two calculations with policy, right? One is it, it has to be an answer to the physics of the planet, right? And the other is the politics. The minute we do anything other than give the money back to households, we don't get, have a single Republican. So you have, to, you have to balance both of those, right? So um, you know, even a lot of Republicans who I've met with who I say, well, what about paying down the deficit with part of it? They say, no, that's growing government. So we've been very strict on they have to give it back to households, let the market forces go to work. And yes, it would be great to fund research, but you have to be able to get the votes, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question, too. I hope this isn't too far off topic, because your video started, I know you didn't want to get into the science uh, exactly, but your video started that the climate is changing, yes. and it's because of carbon dioxide right. emissions. But there are studies and people that will refute that right off the bat, the cl sure. climate always changes, yeah. and, and, and CO2 has been rising for the last 15, 18, 20 years, and the temperatures have been stable. The models don't really reflect that. So, you lose people, it seems to me, right off the bat. How do you, how do you uh, turn that argument around? Yeah, boy, there's about three hours worth of stuff to say, so let me just touch on a few things, okay? So, um, first of all, you know, up until 1985, there was no question on the science at all. And then, uh, you know, there were particularly some people, uh, and, and particularly concentrated Coke Industries, who said, holy cow, uh, this isn't going to be good for us. And they actually went and hired the same people that were hired for tobacco. Yes, yes, the whole they, merchants of doubts. And what the, the theory was with tobacco was, we don't have to say there's no science. We just have to make people think maybe it's not So for instance, uh, you know, 25, 30 years ago, a physicist, so he's a physicist, I'm not a scientist, knows a lot more about science than I do, Fred Singer, testified in Congress that you couldn't connect smoking and cancer. Fred Singer also testified about five years ago that there's no connection between burning fossil fuels and global warming. 
So the, the where, and, and this is a really, really important piece. There are a lot of people who think it is a 50-50 matter. You know, there's a lot of scientists who, who think that there's global warming, there's a lot of science who don't. That's not the case. You know, in the only place where science actually matters, in the peer review process, where you've so survived the scrutiny of your peers, where you can actually get published in a prestigious journal, 98% of peer reviewed papers in the last 20 years say we have a man-made burning fossil fuel issue. Now, there is a very concerted effort, mostly from people funded by the Koch brothers, to dispute that because it hurts their billions and billions and billions of dollars. It's not the entire fossil fuel industry, so we shouldn't throw everybody in the same boat. If you look at the major multinationals, the Shells, the Exxons of the world, their websites recognize the connection between burning fossil fuels and generating global warming, and they've actually internalized a carbon price for their own organization. So there are people who say that. You know, if you look at the record starting at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, you see a direct connection of CO2 going up and heat going up. What happened was you were going like that decade by decade by decade with the heat going up. And in 1996, there was an El Nino and a La Nina. So we ended up with an extremely hot year. So for 14 years after that, the planet was not as hot as it was in 1996. But that year was an outlier. You still see the decades of trends going up. So what people did is jumped on that one data point and said the planet hasn't warmed for the last 14 years. That was technically correct, but entirely disingenuous because it, it ignored the, the trend over time. Now, 2014 ended up being warmer than 1996, so that argument about it not warming doesn't exist. There, there will be people who will continue to make those arguments. Is that even though there's not one peer-reviewed paper that validates it, there's some, still some people that say the sun is, is hotter now and it's, it's the same thing. So that's going to continue to happen. And the Koch brothers between the two of them have, what, $72 billion or something? They will continue to fund you know, Americans for Prosperity, the Cato Institute, other organizations that will promote that. Um, it's incumbent on people like me to let as many people know as possible that the science is settled. There's no dispute in the actual peer-reviewed world. It's in the people who are trying to dispute the science world. <laughs> yeah, we have our own people at our own Thanksgiving dinner that we don't talk to this about. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, Lord. Those family meetings are a challenge, right? Oh, yeah. so, and this, this is maybe just a little plug for next week. We are having uh, Dr. Richard Somerville here next Tuesday. Here's, he is one Scripps. of our, yeah, from Scripps. He is one of our premier climate scientists mm. in San Diego. He was one of the scientists when the IPCC won yeah. the Nobel Peace Prize along yeah. with at Al Gore in 2007. Yeah. So he will be here next Tuesday. And he's no longer, he's retired, so he can be much freer with his, uh, mm -hmm. with his speaking. Yeah. Kind of like yeah. Dr. Hansen now. And I want to get the title right. It's like, uh, what does a climate scientist think we should do about climate change? Uh -huh. So if you want to hear it from somebody who no longer has, a, uh, has to, to say what he's expected to say, that's yeah. next Tuesday night. And, and, and he he's really is a, as credible a scientist as yeah. you can ask for. Um, the other side of this, I did actually have Fred Singer on a panel that I did at the IEEE about a decade ago because we, the coordinator for the panel said we need to have balance. And so he invited Fred Singer and I had all the other people that I thought were credible. And I just, I was actually embarrassed for the quality of the presentation he did. And I said, is that really what you're mm. using as science? Is that your argument? Because it was the least scientific, the least the least credible presentation I had ever seen, uh -huh. and he's given as an expert. Yeah. So that I was just stunned that his name still comes up as one of these experts from the other side because I was I was embarrassed for how bad a presentation uh -huh. he gave as a as an argument. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Cool. So, I'm sorry. So okay. Well, was, no, no, I, I was just gonna. Other, do you want to keep going now, Mark? Or? No, no, I'm, I'm going to just wrap up, and then when the people can stick around if they want. You want to get more. another question in here first? Oh, Tuesday night, same time here, 6 o'clock, the 24th. Cool. And what's the person's name again? Uh, Dr. Richard Somerville. So that's, that's seven, next Tuesday. Next Tuesday is not Wednesday like tonight? Correct. It's okay. Tuesday night. Okay, good. Yes. It's okay. Just your perception, uh, I, you, you've indicated that you deal with numbers of, you know, 435 representatives and 100 senators. 
but it, it doesn't seem like we've got 435 votes in the House. It's there's two votes. There's the Republican vote and the Democratic vote, and we you know we we should just save money and just have two senators and and two representatives because they vote in a block. Have you do you foresee the ability with your meetings to break people free from that? block. Yeah, so it's 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 really really been a hard being a Republican for about the last 10 years. There's so many people that want to come out and do something reasonable on this issue and they're afraid of being primary from the right. So they're just looking for any shift in the politics to be ready to move. So we did um, you know the the uh, report that we did, the Remy report on the economic benefits of of this policy. We did uh, two briefings on Capitol Hill of that in November. We had to turn people away from the House and the Senate. In the Senate briefing, 40% of the people there were Republican offices. In the House, 25% of the people were Republican offices. We had another briefing on the House side today. It was 50-50 between Democrats and Republicans. We have uh, one Republican in the Senate and two in the House that are reviewing our exact language for legislation uh, and are really interested in introducing it. Uh, we've been asking Democrats for the last couple of years not to introduce bills because we want it to either be bipartisan or introduced by a Republican, so it doesn't just get introduced as a, as a partisan thing. Um, actually, when you sit down with Republicans, it's not like what you hear on the cable shows and the, and the radio. It's why I really encourage people to do it. Um, they, they know that arguing against science is a bad long-term strategy. Science always catches up with you. you know, science like people's opinion. You know, the airplane has to fly, the antibiotic has to work. Scientists, when they write papers, they know that their accountability is always going to catch up with them in the world. So there are Republicans who know, and including the Republican National Committee, that they've got to do something about this or they're going to lose credibility as a party. I think what you're going to see is something that's going to flip kind of like how uh, marriage equality did, where it seemed like it could never happen, never happen, and then boom, suddenly it was legal everywhere. So um, the, the politics are getting very, very close. One thing that all politicians are really good is at sensing politics and political change. And they've just been too frightened to do anything, but they're getting very, very close to, to uh, making something happen soon. Okay. All right. Oh, goodness, Chris, I'll get answer these quick. I was I was going to wrap up, but I'm going to take a couple more questions. Uh, Naomi Klein, Klein, in her recent book, spoke about the... Uh, percentage of people who had to uh, be visible in support of something before there's change. Mm. And she basically was talking about taking to the streets yes. to get this, these numbers out. Yeah. What do you make of, of her projection? Um, I've read some social science studies that say that when 10% of a population is um, passionate about anything, it seems as if everybody is. Uh, I was happy that the big march happened in New York where there was somewhere between a half a million and 800,000 people there. I think all that's important. Uh, we're not going to do everything. We're not going to be people organizing marches. We're going to be the people that are closest enough to every member of the House and Senate when there's a chance to get a bill done, we're going to get the right bill done. But yeah, that's, it's important that those kinds of things are happening. Yeah. I'm going to raise my hand too. I've, I have a question on the, the competitiveness of the U.S. If we do this in the U.S. and add this fee and dividend to our economy, yeah. how does that affect our competitiveness against other countries that yeah. maybe don't adopt it? Yeah, so, so in, in any proposal like this, one of the things you put into is, is a border adjustment, which is essentially a border tra tariff. So if you talk to the best people who are World Trade Organization legal experts, they say that if, if, let's say we did a fee and China didn't, that we would impose a tariff at the border that would adjust for the lack of there being a price on carbon in, in China. Now, the reason you do that is not because you actually want to collect that tariff. You do it because you want to incentivize China to impose their own carbon price. Now, China is in the process of already implementing seven provincial uh, prices throughout the country. Uh, so they're in the process of moving, but the best World Trade Organization's experts tell us that we could put a protection at the border if we needed to if other countries didn't. So we would not lose any jobs, no competitiveness, et cetera. Thank you. Yeah. Um, boy, there's still hands still going Okay, up. all right. We'll take a couple more. We'll take a couple more. Okay. Um, so if we want to get involved, what's the Oh, the exactly roadmap? what I wanted to say. That's what I wanted to say. Save that. Hold a second. No, no, no. Laura, come no, on in for a second. Do it now. 
Can you come up for just one second? You have a sign-up sheet, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, so this is so let me let me give you a couple ways. First of all, Laura has a sign-up sheet. So if you sign up, then what we'll do is we'll invite you to where the local meetings are. You could go to our website, citizensclimatelobby.org, and register yourself as a supporter. Um, we're a nonprofit. You could write a check for a million dollars. There's, there's like all kinds of cool things you could do. We would not be offended if you or anybody you knew could do something like that. So yeah, you could, you could give Laura your name. You could go to our website, so, uh, and we would connect you to the appropriate group. This is Climate Obby up in number two. You can go there and yeah. sign up, right? There yeah. Uh, just to follow up on the question you asked, um, on LinkedIn, uh, Statoil, the Norwegian oil company, uh, they've been looking for solutions, and they've been begging the U.S. to adopt a carbon tax policy. Mm -hmm. um, they're trying to rally support in Europe, and um, Europeans feel that Americans are lagging behind on this issue. So I don't know that we could get China, but we can definitely get on the Europeans' good side by a policy like this. Well, the, the, so the European Trade Union has the biggest cap-and-trade program in the world. And it's really what's shown the failure of that problem is what happened in Europe. There's too many permits. It's not doing enough to reduce emissions. Sweden has $100 a ton carbon tax already. And they've had steady growth in GDP since they imposed it. So it's another reason British Columbia has one in Canada. They actually grew better than the rest of Canada during the worldwide recession. So the, you, for people who say, oh, no, it's going to kill the economy, there's just no evidence for it. So, but, but we know as soon as the US acts, a whole bunch of other countries move with us. They've just been waiting for us. Uh, Ron Amberger, San Diego. Uh, what are you proposing for a method to redistribute this tax to the people? We, How you, do you have a formula in mind? Yeah, I, we do. I, I assume the politicians want to know that. Yes, we do. So our, our proposal is that you essentially give every household the same amount of money. What we more specifically say... How do you define a household? Um, well, I, I, let me start where we started and what I think is going to end up happening. Okay? We say a household could be a maximum of two adults per household, and that you could have up to two half shares for children. So the most any household can get would be three, essentially three uh, amounts on the same check. Yeah. So now many conservative economists who argue for carbon tax prefer a tax swap. They would like to see a reduction of corporate taxes and a, redu a reduction of income taxes. Secretary Schultz, when he argued Dividend, that is getting a monthly check, is the most honest, transparent, hardest to rig solution. So I think we need to do the most honest, the most transparent, the hardest to rig solution. And also, I think Americans aren't going to support it if they don't see themselves getting a check. See, we all live in California, right? We live in California. Part of AB 32 is you get a reduction on your utility bill, but you don't know it. So you, I, I, I'm, listen. Uh, the most fanatical people on this issue don't know that they get a reduction on their bill. So this huge amount of political capital got wasted on AB 32 because you don't know you get a credit on your utility bill. We don't want to have people not know that they're getting something for that legislation. It'd be more like the Alaska Permanent Fund where Alaskans get a tax check once a year. Yeah. That's what Secretary Schultz says. And not only was he Secretary Schultz and Secretary of the Treasury, he was also the chairman the University of Chicago, so I'm, I suspect he wasn't too shabby of economist also. You wanted to summarize. I would like to summarize, but we'll stick around for a few minutes if people have other questions. So first of all, we do have a sign-in sheet. You could go to our website. Uh, we have really good chapters here in San Diego. Uh, they regularly meet with people from Boxers and Feinstein's office uh, with the San Diego delegation, who in general have been great. Um, ICE has been a little bit of a knucklehead, but, um, you know, they, they've been great. I mean, um, Duncan Hunter regularly meets with his. His dad regularly met with him. Susan Davis has always been great. Brian Bilbray was fabulous when he was on office here. Um, you know, Scott Peters, fantastic. Um, Vargas. Uh, the, the San Diego delegation has just been really great, really easy to meet with. And uh, Boxer and Feinstein's office has also been really good and helpful. So the, what, again, I'll stick around and take any more questions, but I just want to tell you the same thing I tell CCL volunteers when they're considering joining the organization. So we, we didn't have to write our own marketing materials because it was actually written in 1914. So if you decide to become part of organization, here's what you're signing up for. We actually stole this from uh, Ernest Shackleton when he was starting the uh, 1914 exploration of, the, of Antarctica. 
He says men wanted. I'll say men or women. Men or women wanted for hazardous journey. Small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return downfall, honor and recognition in case of success. <laughs> so, so what we're offering you is, is if this turns out, somebody might thank you for it one day. <laughs> okay. All right, Peter, thank you so much for the invitation. Give I really a big hand. Up. Okay, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. Yeah. That was terrific, Mark. Thank you very much. Yeah, and and he is not a PhD. I gave him that uh, award when he walked up here. So, Thank you. Yeah, All right, I'll take yeah. that. Yeah. Honorary. Uh, he certainly has earned it. So uh, um, another terrific evening. I, I really want to thank CCL and, and Mark for joining us. Uh, he did mention if you got that million dollars, we promised that we would share it tonight. So uh, if, if you're going to contribute, it's, it's split 50-50. He would like you to join their organization, and I want to invite you to do the same. We do our events here almost every week, which include Green Scene Evenings. We partner with the San Diego Renewable Energy Society. Uh, some of you have been to those. We have a commitment in San Diego to be 100% renewable, and we've partnered with four organizations to drive that initiative here in our own city. Uh, it's a pretty big lift from where we are right now. The city's at 8%. The utility is at 33%. So 100% is a long way away. But it's in our climate action plan to be 100% renewable in San Diego by 2035. So we are helping to drive that initiative. Uh, we do movie nights, movies that make a difference. We have one at the end of this month, uh, a Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio movie. And next month, there is a great film that just got published out of China that's now banned called Under the Dome, a very... Uh, uh, a very progressive and courageous producer in China said, we have the worst pollution of any country on the planet. And she put a documentary on it, kind of like a TEDx presentation. And it's online. And we will show that next month as well. So that's our movie nights. So we invite you back. If you, uh, you want to be a member, we'd love to have you be a member. You can come for free. If you, if you don't want to be a member, we certainly invite you to throw a contribution in when you come. Uh, it's been wonderful having you here, Mark, having you all here. Uh, please stick around. You don't have to leave. We'll have uh, some more food, some more drink. Thank you all for coming.